Good evening, and welcome to Front Row at Drake. My name is John Fender, Associate Professor of Art and Design at Drake University. For this episode of Front Row at Drake, I'm excited to bring you a lecture by guest artist and Drake alum, Claire Sadovic. This lecture took place several weeks ago as part of the Art and Design Alumni Impact Series. To listen to more of these talks, visit the Anderson Gallery's YouTube channel. Claire graduated from Drake in 2015 with a BFA in graphic design. Following graduation, Claire was selected as the Drake Artist in Residence at Des Moines Mainframe Studios. Each year through a competitive application process, Drake provides a graduate with one year of rent-free workspace at Mainframe Studios. This unique opportunity allows artists to jumpstart their career and boosts Central Iowa's creative economy. Listen to learn about Claire's recent work and how she sought refuge in her art during the pandemic. Hello, good evening, and welcome to tonight's artist lecture at Drake University. Um, I'm Professor Emily Newman. Uh, before we begin and before I introduce our artist, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that at Drake University, we are gathered on the traditional, ancestral, unceded land of the Iowa, Sauk, and Meskwaki peoples, and we offer our respect to, the, to their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. I'd like to say that we recognize that our presence here today is the result of the ongoing exclusions and erasure of indigenous peoples who were the original stewards of this land. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, let the ties these nations have to their traditional homelands be renewed and reaffirmed. I'd like to introduce Claire Sedovic. She's a Drake University alum. Claire graduated in 2015 with a BFA in graphic design. She was the Drake alum artist in residence at Mainframe Studios in downtown Des Moines, Iowa in 2019 through 2020. Hailing from St. Louis, Missouri, Claire has remained in Des Moines since her time at Drake. Please join me in welcoming Claire Sedovic. Thank you, Emily, for the introduction. I'm so excited to virtually be here with you all tonight. When I first thought about giving this lecture, I imagined myself standing in front of a live audience. Social distancing was not yet part of our shared lexicon and no one donned a mask as habitually as slipping into a pair of socks before leaving home. That was nearly 10 months ago. Between then and now, I lost then regained two jobs, wrote and illustrated a picture book from beginning to end, moved out of the Drake University alumni studio at Mainframe Studios and into another, and most recently became a college art and design instructor at Grandview University. It's been a tumultuous year to say nothing of the events outside of my four studio walls. The one constant, however, has been art. For more than a month after the pandemic became our collective reality, I sought refuge in my studio and the blank piece of paper I set before myself day after day. It was what I fell asleep thinking about at night and what I woke up thinking about in the morning. When my mind started to swirl with anxiety, when my fingers itched to read just one more COVID-19 news flash, I thought of Theodore, the stuffed rabbit and eponymous character of my latest children's book. But it was not Theodore's plush belly and floppy ears that lent me comfort as life as we knew it was turned on its head. For me, Theodore was one thing that I controlled. From quick gestural sketches, to fully rendered spreads, Theodore remained my constant, a wellspring of creativity to stave off both the darkness of a global pandemic and the brightness of the blank page before me. Therefore, in deciding what I wanted to speak about tonight, the obvious choice was to share with you the lessons I have learned as a picture book artist navigating 2020. Consider this the artist survival guide to creating during a pandemic. In the spring of 2019, 
I realized a lifelong goal of becoming a published children's book illustrator. After quitting a lucrative yet unfulfilling full-time job as a graphic designer at a media company in April of 2018, I was hired by Blue Manatee Press, a small independent publisher in Cincinnati, Ohio, to illustrate Odd Animal ABCs by the author June Smalls. It was a role I had rehearsed many times before. Animals were frequent features of my childhood oeuvre. Certainly, I was proud of the work I did for Odd Animals. I can now draw tigers as well as every other animal from A to Z much better than my six-year-old self could. And yet, something is inevitably lost in the years between childhood and adulthood, not only a preference for drawing with crayons. In order to illustrate and write for children, you must think like a child. And the practice of tapping into your own inner child is one that must be continually honed. For me, it often starts with a memory. A trip to the zoo. Carving jack-o'-lanterns for Halloween. Or cozying up with a big stack of library books. These are just a few memories that have fueled my creative process this year. Communing with your inner child requires that you temporarily set aside your very real adult worries, a tall order in 2020, and adopt a fresh mindset instead. It's where my best ideas for writing and illustrating spring from, not to mention a welcome respite from crunching numbers to cover next month rent or planning my next, next masked grocery store excursion. Consider your inner child a muscle one that must be flexed and contracted continually to avoid atrophy. Eventually, it takes less effort. So nearly a year after I published my first book, amid a growing global pandemic, when I found myself without a job, yet with plenty of time on my hands, I knew just what to do, make art. Which leads me to my next point. A typical picture book has 32 pages, including title page, dedication, and copyright, each of which provides a blank canvas for illustration. And while I now write as well as illustrate my own stories, for me, the beginning of a new story starts with pictures, not words. I'll doodle character sketches for weeks before my story has a fully fleshed out plot. I'll dream in watercolor shades of pink and purple and everything in between before I've got the cadence of the first sentence right. When a rough draft is finally written, I gravitate towards those illustrations that are already living inside my head, that only wait for me to pick up a pencil to come alive on paper. And sometimes, as is the case with the hug for Theodore, it's the very last page of the book. These days, when so much is uncertain, I find comfort in knowing how my story is going to end. That's the beauty of narrative art. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's once upon a time and happily ever after. When artist block strikes as it inevitably does, I need only tell myself to turn to the next page because there's always something more to illustrate. So make good art, make lousy art, make art for a purpose or make no art for, make art for no reason at all. Just make art. And when you make art, take risks. Risk in art can be as simple as trying a new medium or looking for a new perspective. I still remember my second grade art teacher commenting to my parents that I like to draw very small if only he could see what I draw now. For me, working in isolation this spring pushed my artistic style in a direction I would have been loath to try in front of my peers. Certainly, as artists, we need feedback, both the criticism and the accolades. But there's also a benefit to a no-consequence approach to creating. 
if there was ever a time to make art that fulfills you and not an audience's expectations, that time is now. Only Theodore has far to fall if something does succeed, and surely one of these elephants will catch him. I too have someone to break my fall. I would not be sitting here tonight speaking with you without the unfailing support of my family, friends, and community. My family has long been both my first bastion of support and well-informed critique. Certainly, it helps to have an artistically inclined mother, father, and sister. When I first broke into the world of children's literature, it was to find, much to my surprise, a burgeoning community of increasingly diverse and yet liked-minded creatives, determined to write, illustrate, and publish for arguably the most important readership, kids. The Iowa chapter of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, or SCBWI as it is known, welcomed me with open arms. I was soon part of a writer illustrator critique group with whom two years on, I still meet monthly, albeit now virtually. It is as much a social gathering or group therapy session as it is a critique of our craft. Finally, since August of 2019, I felt at home at yet another community, Mainframe Studios. It is my honor not only to present my story tonight as part of the Anderson Gallery Winter Showcase, but also as a recent artist in residence for the Drake University Alumni Studio at Mainframe. Since becoming a tenant at Mainframe Studios, I have felt a sense of belonging to something bigger something far more impactful than my own illustration practice and soon to be complete third floor studio. Indeed, Mainframe Studios is making a big impact. It's one of the largest affordable workspaces for artists in the country. And I'm honored to count myself among those who call it a second home. This year, when we are physically, if not mentally and emotionally more isolated than ever before, I'm so grateful to the people and the communities in my life who have helped me feel less alone. I don't for a moment flatter myself to think my situation is unique, but the people who showed up for me in the spring to fill the blank spaces on my calendar with virtual yoga classes, my mailbox with handwritten notes, and my bank account with money to buy myself a bottle of wine and a bouquet, they are special. And as someone whose three-year-old catchphrase of, I do it my own self, still holds true at 28, this year has been a lesson in humility. I would be nothing without the support of my friends and family. And without family, I doubt I would be sharing with you this last point of my presentation. I come from a long maternal line of teachers, and as I continue to grow as an artist, I understand even better how my words, pictures, and actions can help shape younger generations. These days, we share our work through so various social media platforms with the tap of a finger. The real challenge I have come to learn, however, is not sharing the work itself, but sharing the knowledge of how that work is made. If sharing your art feels a bit like bearing your soul, then teaching how to make art is like dissecting yourself to peel back the layers of your own artistic method. It is at times both an excruciating and exhilarating process to see what lies underneath. Despite the fact that my mother, grandmother, great-grandmother and sister have pursued teaching careers. Until this fall, I never envisioned myself standing in front of a class of college art students, as I have day after day, week after week at Grandview University. We are now a mere three weeks away from finishing the semester. This fall, my drawing students have learned everything from gesture to one-point perspective, developed a comfort level with critiquing their peers' work, and examined their own doubts and inhibitions when they stare at the blank page. They have learned a lot, 
but so have I. I realized I'm no longer content to just make art. Teaching art scratches an itch I didn't even know I had. To share with others the lessons I have had to learn to reach where I am now, just as I am sharing them with you all tonight. In a way, it has come full circle. Every time a student has that aha moment, it's like reliving the experience myself. I'm once again tapping into, if not my childhood, then my younger artist self, the one with less answers, but no less of a passion to create. And in a year when we cannot always have our friends and our family physically near us, when toilet paper is scarce and the walls of our homes are all too familiar, it is so satisfying to create something from a blank page. So whether or not you consider yourself an artist, whether you are well acquainted with your inner child or you have yet to meet, I hope you pick up a pencil, a paintbrush, a pen, and make art. We need it now more than ever. Many of my friends, family, and peers were alluded to tonight, if not specifically mentioned in this presentation. And I owe thanks to you all. Also special thanks to Emily Newman for heading the artist residency program at Mainframe Studios, to Julia Franklin of the Anderson Gallery who invited me to be a part of the Winter Showcase, and to Lydia White who helped make this live stream possible. I'm also grateful to my former professors of art and design at Drake, especially Neil Ward who saw the teacher in me before I did. And finally, credit for the photos from my Odd Animal ABCs book launch goes to my best friend and talented photographer, Emma Crosscree. You can find more of my work on Instagram or my website to keep up the conversation. And I'd love to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, I'd like to remind anyone watching right now that um, if you have a question, put it in the chat of whichever platform you're viewing, whether that's Facebook or YouTube, and we will um, post it for Claire to see. But Claire, I yeah. actually had a question for you. Talking about taking risks and the importance of that, and you were talking about it sort of in the context of 2020 or how that's something that you've done um, or something that's helped you in 2020. Can you get a little bit um, more in, talk a little bit more about how you took the risk from moving from a job mm -hmm. in a the graphic design firm into the world of publishing, um, especially because at Drake, we don't have an illustration major, for right. instance, like some other schools have. Um, how did you navigate that process? Yeah. How did you take um, that I'll risk? try and make this as succinct as possible because I feel like with many things like this, it's kind of a winding journey. Um, but I know I touched on it a number of times. I even had a picture that I drew when I was four years old. Um, it's nothing new, that desire to, to illustrate and write for children. As a child, I probably didn't identify it as such, but um, it's always been something I've wanted to do. Um, so yeah, there came a concrete moment um, in my career as a graphic designer specifically. I still design today, but um, it's a little bit different. Um, but there was a point where I needed to make that change and I took that leap, um, which was a risk, but kind of along with my last point there, the support was already in place. Um, I knew probably one particular illustrator who had encouraged me um, for a couple years to join SCBWI. So I immediately pursued um, kind of finding out about that community. And like I said, was um, welcomed readily into that group. Um, it's actually an international organization um, that does a lot of really great stuff in the industry. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was definitely that moment of kind of free fall, but at the same time, I think, and even now at that point in my career in a little bit now, sometimes you don't know what you don't know and that's for the best, right? You get older and you're not as willing to take those risks, but um, it felt like the time was right and it was a desire I always had. And I think with the career in design that I had, I wasn't having as much time to draw and illustrate and do even 
just any sort of work by hand that I'd done a lot as a student at Drake, and I, I just felt the need to do more of that. Yeah. So um, a sort of quick follow up on mm -hmm. that, and then we'll get to the question from Grace, was that, was the organization then that you joined, was that the way that you sort of began to understand the publishing world and like how oh, to get yeah. your foot in the door? Was that? Yeah, actually, yeah. gosh, yeah, that's definitely yes. Um, and then it was really honestly serendipitous is the best word I can think of to describe it. I quit my job as a graphic designer full time in April. And then the following month I was offered the job to illustrate odd animal ABCs, um, which is, and I understand this better now that I've been doing this for a couple years, that's kind of unheard of, honestly. It happened because I'd been putting out feelers already, which is something I could have answered your question with before. Um, illustrators still send out physical postcards in the mail to publishers and art directors. So I'd been doing some of that. Social media, of course, counts for a lot. So um, I kind of planted the seed for that already, and it just, honestly happened to come to fruition right when I quit that job, which was really fortunate because that was the majority of my summer doing freelance like that. So, um, and then, yeah, I think kind of retroactively after that, um, being in a writer's critique group, um, which was a smaller part of SCBWI and just the wider group going to conferences and such, um, I kind of learned on the back end what all is supposed to happen. And I kind of, yeah, retroactively learned it. <laughs> yeah, cool. We've got a lot of questions great, now. Great. So, um, Grace Murphy is asking, what have been what have been some of your favorite teaching moments that you would say shaped the teacher that you are today? That's kind of a tough one to think about, I think. So, teaching moments from when I was a student to reflect how I teach today. Is that how I'm interpreting it? I think so. I think that might be the question. Yeah. Gosh, I think it's. If it's not a moment, then it's certainly a specific instructor, um, you know, that that stick with you. Um, gosh, I mean, that's just I'm going to have a hard time pinpointing something right now because my experience, including your class, Emily at Drake, were they were all really, really positive experiences. And I do find myself thinking back, you know, when I'm trying to teach, like coming up with project ideas and such. Um, I've done a lot of curriculum building this fall. And yeah, I'm always kind of going back, if not to my physical portfolio, some pieces I still have from Drake, then trying to remember um, those lessons that really stuck with me, um, certainly from college. I have to keep thinking on that. If something specific comes up, I will definitely yeah. either. Um, then I'll say the one thing that's really stuck with me from my teaching experience as an instructor on the other end, um, I really, it's just, I have a small group of students for my drawing class. I've only got nine in there. Um, and it's just been so gratifying to get to know them on a personal level, which is tough when you're doing this virtually. But um, a lot of the projects we do in there are maybe a little bit more technical. Um, we recently did do one about art and fear and um, kind of a phobia drawing or a paranoia. And that was just interesting to kind of get to hear um, from some freshmen who are just kind of getting into this. Um, we talked about the fears, like I mentioned, that they have when they um, start drawing, right? Those doubts they have about themselves and their credentials as an artist, um, as well as getting a little bit more creative with the phobia drawings. And that was just, um, it was just really eye-opening to get to hear from, from their younger perspective. All right. Professor Lyons, um, do you ever try out ideas with child readers? Um, you know, it's, I'm trying to think, a um, little bit, not not recently. My, um, my mom's a preschool teacher, so um, she's got the kid connections that I don't have. But um, with my critique group as well, they've got kids, um, the other women that I'm with in my group. So um, we can always bounce things around there. Um, and then kind of as a follow-up, I guess I'd say, um, yeah, it can be a little isolating when you're working, um, you know, in your own studio um, on work that has a specific audience. Um, but I did, and of course this was pre-pandemic, um, in 2019 get to visit um, a school and do a presentation and read Odd Animal ABCs with them, which um, was also really eye-opening with the even younger group of kids um, to get their perspective on it and um, kind of feel like a rock star for a day. <laughs> yeah. Well, and when you were at Mainframe pre-pandemic, yeah. you were doing um, the Friday 
first Fridays of every month, you would often open your studio and allow kids to come in. You'd have like printable illustrations yeah. that they could color and you had a whole like setup for that was very welcoming. So yeah. I think really I'm glad you mentioned that. It's, yeah, it's been such a different year this time, these past few months that we haven't done first Fridays, but you're right. I definitely try to make my studio and when I have my final studio on the third floor when construction is finished, um, definitely make it kid friendly, yeah. Yeah, I will say I think your um, I think Odd Animal ABCs is, is on what's called Bookflix, uh -huh. which is a elementary website that I know Des Moines Public Schools uses, and um, awesome. I think it's that or I, it's accessible that way because I saw it on That's my great. computer and I was like, yeah, oh. we have it at the Central Library here too. That's so <laughs> That's great. All right. Chloe asks, what do you think are the most important skills for entering the illustration world? It's a good question. That is a really good question. I think you you definitely have to have, we could say like the hard skills, right? Like you go to school, you learn how to draw. And a lot of that, again, might be the technical skills, right? I don't draw realistically for my illustrations. I can because I learned it, right? Um, but you kind of need that that foundation. So on one level, I think there's the foundational stuff that you need to be strong in. And then beyond that, as you're entering the illustration world, I think the biggest thing I've learned is just, just doing the work because that's where you start to build your own style. I think artists talk a lot about the elusive style, right? What is your style? How do you get a style? It's not something you go out and procure. It's something that just develops. And there's nothing wrong when you're first entering that world to um, not necessarily copying the masters, but being inspired by other people. Um, but just knowing that there will always be trends and doing your work that's authentic to you, I think is the most important skill that you can continue to build. And that just comes from doing it over and over and over. And eventually it becomes authentically yours. And that will speak to people who want to publish you eventually because it's not going to look like everybody else on Instagram. Yeah, I think that's excellent advice, um, especially about the style stuff. I mean, yeah. You, yeah, you you get it by making, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and no the way around it. <laughs> like, oh, that's that thread, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Christy says, what is something from your time at Drake that you continue to take with you into your professional journey? Oh, that's a good one too. Something from my time at Drake, professional journey. Wow, I think, um, I'm going to answer with the first thing that comes to mind, and that is just taking advantage of like every opportunity that comes your way. I can remember when I was a freshman, um, the Anderson Gallery did a coordinated exhibition with the artist David Hamlow and allowed, um, he's a uh, works in uh, 3D. He did some um, kind of Sculpture with, sculptures with recycled materials and um, students were encouraged to like help collaborate on that. And I remember as a freshman coming in um, thinking, oh, that sounds really cool. I'll take advantage of that. I'll, I'll do that. And that's kind of just become my playbook, I feel like, for the last few years to the extent that I've kind of had to step back a little bit and say, okay, like you can only handle so much at one time, right? So what are the things you really want to pursue? Um, but I think Drake definitely for me kind of solidified that idea of um, especially being here in Des Moines. There's a reason I haven't left, but taking advantage of things like this winter showcase where I get to, you know, speak to a wider audience, things like the mainframe residency, um, just all these things that, um, again, you kind of plant the seeds and then it feels like they're just coming to you, but you've put in the work to get those opportunities. Um, so there's a little bit of pursuit on the one end and then you do reap the benefits of that. It takes a lot of work and that's, yeah, that's definitely what I learned at Drake that I've taken with me. Yeah, that's a really great answer because there mm -hmm. there's so much and it does get overwhelming. You're like, I can only yeah. do so much, but yeah. <laughs> um, Hey, the Anderson Gallery has a question. Can you address uh, your mainframe studio space and how it impacted your art practice? And I know that this is sort of a weird question because halfway through your residency, the pandemic hit, so. Which honestly, kind of like I said in my presentation, for me, I feel really, really fortunate that um, I was still able to go to mainframe. Um, of course, um, 
not everyone was able to to be as mobile. I wasn't as homebound at that time, even though I did lose temporarily two um, part-time jobs that I had in addition to my um, illustration practice. I was able to go to mainframe every day. I'd never been quite as disciplined in doing so because frankly, before that, I didn't have as much time and I would be there in the evenings. Um, so in one way, even though there were less artists there at the time, just because of what was happening in the world. People were being cautious about things. Um, you know, in a way, I kind of did feel a little bit more of a solidarity with the artists that were in their studios. You know, we'd wave to each other on the hall and stuff because um, I had built up a relationship with my neighbors um, on the fourth floor there. Um, so I think, yeah, in general, just having more time to do stuff, um, that was huge. Having the space to do it outside of where I'm sitting right now. I love working in my living room, but in the afternoons, it's nice to have somewhere else to go. Um, and of course, mainframe is built around collaboration, right? Not as easy right now when we're in the middle of a pandemic, but um, it's so fun to be able to walk down the hall and, you know, see a photographer or a sculptor and be inspired by that. That's literally just next door to you. So, yeah. Yeah. In that case, how often do you deviate from two dimensional drawing and illustrations to feed your inspiration? Or do you do that in terms of looking at other people's work or um, um, yourself using a different way of making? That's from Riley. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm 2D through and through. <laughs> I struggle to think in three dimensions. Um, and yet I would say the collaboration for me has been um, largely with the individual artists that are um, at Mainframe building those relationships. Um, if the pandemic had not happened, I had plans with um, a sculptor, a potterer, a ceramicist, I should say, and um, an oil painter who were neighbors of mine there, still good friends with. We were gonna do um, a children's like art camp over the summer. So unfortunately that got panned, um, but certainly there's opportunity in the future for that. Um, and then things that have actually um, worked out, I had um, four artists, actually five if I count, um, one who spoke to my digital class. Um, I built up relationships with those artists that they were more than happy to speak to my college students and kind of give a little bit of background and talk about their own practices like I am tonight. Um, so that was really cool to kind of make that connection, especially because, you know, Drake has a connection with um, Mainframe and I know Grandview and other local universities are really looking to kind of build that relationship as well, since it's right in their backyard. So, yeah. All right. We have another question from Chloe, who's interested in maybe some um, pretty yeah. practical tips on like sure. networking and freelancing. And what was the most effective way from your experience to get your name out there? I, I mean, I think social network, like social media and having a solid website are huge. Um, it's something that I can definitely do better at, but I think especially if you're in Des Moines, it really, it sounds so trite to say it, but it's true. It's, it's who you know. And I think, again, this is a little bit different when you're maybe not meeting with large groups of people um, in person, but just getting in on those circles, um, you know, maybe there's a wider community like SCBWI that you can be a part of. I think, you know, if you have an interest like that, there's probably a professional community, a professional group that you could um, find out about and join. Um, and I just find too, I mean, in Des Moines, I feel like my like social and professional circles, you could draw it as like a Venn diagram because there's just so much overlap from the people I know at Drake to Grandview to Mainframe to previous jobs in the art or design community. Um, I think it's just physically putting yourself out there too. So maybe there's a little bit more reliance on the the social and the, the website aspect of it right now. But, you know, when you can get out there again, I think, I think that's the biggest help for me, honestly. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I think you're right. And I think also, I mean, Des Moines has a fairly small. Right, because it's small. Mm -hmm. Our community. But I would say that that's great advice for any any place, whether you live in New York or Minneapolis. Like, yeah, a lot of people, if you, they know who you are, they're going to call you up for, not really, but email you <laughs> to really? see if you can do something, you know, or speak to their class or whatever. So I think you're right in terms of just being able to network. Um, I wanted to ask you just really quick. Yeah. 
how do you manage your time in terms of dealing with, because for you, especially as someone who's um, went into freelancing, both as an illustrator, which is pretty freelance in a certain way, um, how do you manage the sort of like admin responsibilities that updating a website and doing social media and all of those things sort of, mm -hmm. they take up a lot of time. I mean, people have them at their sole jobs and artists, right. artists are expected to do all of it. Yeah, so I'll preface that with, I could definitely do all of those things better, I think. Um, for me, I'm very much a planner and I think I've developed a system in which like, I I'm good at doing certain things at certain points in the day. I don't want to answer emails in the afternoon. I do that over a cup of coffee in the morning and that's great. I'll do billing and invoices on Mondays. Like I've just kind of set it out. Like I'm that kind of strategic about it. That helps me to have, if not certain hours to do things and certain days to do those sort of things. Um, I think especially too, because like if I need to send an invoice or something, if it can wait until that following Monday, it's like you just stash it away in the back of your head and you're not thinking about those things and you're free to create and you don't feel guilty about it because you know you're going to come back to it and do all that stuff in one morning. And for me, that works. Um, I think the other thing, too, with social media, I kind of go in waves with using that. Um, and I think the best advice I've ever gotten on that is that if you're posting on Instagram your illustrations all the time, then what are you really spending your work doing? Is it all social media? Or are you actually getting the work done? So I kind of go with the idea of if I've done a piece that's worth posting, I'll post it, but I'm not going to do work just for the sake of social media. Cause I think it's really easy to kind of get into that sort of mindset. Um, and then it's like, well, you're not really doing the work then or the work that matters. Yeah. Yeah. That's all good tips. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Claire. I think that you, um, it's certainly been such a treat to see like what you've accomplished in kind of a really short period of time. Thank you. Um, and I'm really, really excited about, um, yeah, your, your futures at Mainframe and at Grandview. Um, thank you. Before we go, do you have any like things that are in your pipeline that you can share with us as what you're doing? Um, I mean, as far as Grandview is concerned, I'm teaching the next level drawing in the spring. So we'll gear up for that over uh, the Christmas holidays. So I'm ready for that. Um, that's exciting for me because that's kind of, like I said, a chapter in my career that I didn't really realize was coming. Um, yeah, in general, as far as um, picture books go, I mean, it's something that is always in the background. If I'm not physically working on something, then I'll have um, artists and il illustrators and writers send out queries, essentially. So it's basically an ask to a publisher or um, an agent to say, hey, I have this idea. Do you want it? Can we work together? So I have a couple of those things out. Again, it's kind of planting those seeds. Um, so nothing specific yet, but um, I've got two books on the back burner that I've been um, trying to find a home for. And um, yeah, hopefully within the next few years, maybe illustrating something again for Blue Manatee Press because um, they were really great to collaborate with too. So yeah. Cool. Uh, Leo chimed in, in terms of getting your name out, would you say that there was a certain event or a project that help you, helped you get to where you are or was it a lot of steady growth? I don't even know if it's steady growth. I feel like it's all <laughs> kind of sporadic, or at least it feels like that. Um, something specific event. Mm. I I don't know that there was something. That's hard thinking back. I feel like it's more cumulative. I mean, Odd Animal ABCs was a big thing, you know, when it came out. But in a way, it's almost kind of like, okay, that was one thing. I'm still proud of that. But let's move on to the next thing, you know, and keep growing from that. Um, I think the piece of advice I'd give for that in general, which isn't necessarily your question, but um, going back to websites and just continually like updating that and looking at, if you're thinking about what provides growth, like keeping that current and putting the work out there that you want people to see and the kind of work you want people to ask you to do is huge. And that's where that growth is gonna come from. Really good advice. Hope that helps. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to encourage everybody to please follow the Anderson Gallery on Instagram. They're doing a huge um, winter uh, alumni showcase so that you get some fresh 
um, art from Drake alums um, each week through Instagram and Facebook. So make sure to check out both of their handles. Hopefully we can get those in the chat so that you can see those. Um, and also give Claire a follow on Instagram and visit her website, say hello. I'm sure as a Drake alum, she'd be more than willing to answer. I'm giving this, I'm just saying this, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure you'd be more than willing to answer oh, any questions oh. if people have more um, about maybe more like in-depth practical things um, that they might be interested in hearing you speak about. Anyway, thanks again, Claire, for taking your evening, um, you. sharing your evening. Um, we look forward to seeing more from you and good luck teaching again in the spring. Thanks so much. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this lecture. For more artist talks and exhibitions, be sure to follow Drake's Anderson Gallery on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. See you next Thursday for another episode of Front Row at Drake.